This interview for the CBT Pioneers Project is with Dr. Richard Swin, ABCT's past president during 1992 to 1993. Dr. Swin agreed to participate in this interview under a unique situation. He's only recently recovering from a stroke, which has affected his speech fluency. Dr. Swin, we're very glad that you're here with us today. Is there anything you'd like to say before we get started with the questions? No, uh, I apologize if I, I'm not as fluent as I would normally be, but we'll get through this best we can and hopefully we we'll have a great interview. Yes. Yeah, thank you for being here with us today. Okay, so Dr. Swin, let's start. Um, I'd really love to know, who are the most important influences on your career? Well, first of all, the one that stands out the most is Brendan Marr, M-A-H-E-R. He had been chair of the Department of Psychology at Harvard and became president of Division 12, Division of Clinical. During his presidency, and when he was designing his convention, he called me and invited me to be part of a symposium panel. I was a young, wet nose assistant professor at the time, and this was my first convention and eventually became one of many conventions that I've been on. That was a starter that was very important to me. He then became editor of the journal Clinical and Consulting Psychology. And again, he reached out to this young man and asked me to be a, a member of his editorial board. And that was the start of my entry into the editorial academy. So he gave me a real boost at the start of my career. In addition to that, I um, feel that I had been influenced by the period of time that I was in graduate school. This was a period of time when behavioral therapy was being birthed. Joe Opie, Arnold Lazarus, Cyril Franks, and a number of other leaders were just pulling together this animal, animal called behavioral therapy, which would become a world force. The interesting thing was the availability and accessibility to these leaders. I visited Joe Wolpe, Cyril Franks, Arnold Lazarus on a trip once, and I was very welcomed by them. It was strange for me to call these people who are lead, leading this development of uh, behavioral therapy by their first name. And in fact, I even had a drink with Cyril Franks, something that was called a shandy. One cannot help but believe that this personal kind of accessibility was an important influence and significant to my career. And what else started your interest in cognitive behavioral treatments? I hear all of these um, influence from, influences from people who influenced you. What about some other things that started your interest in cognitive behavioral treatments? A sports psychology incident was important to my becoming interested 
in behavioral therapy. I was a faculty at a small liberal arts college when a student basketball player came up to me and said, I need help. Can you do something about anxieties? I am a good basketball player, but I have a problem at, when it comes to driving the ball towards the basket. Then I freak out. I get so anxious that I no longer can perform very well. Can you help me get rid of this anxiety? Well, although I was fully trained in the usual psychotherapeutic approaches in graduate school, there was a, this was a, a problem that I couldn't deal with. And I wound up discussing the turning away the, it was one of the few people that I had to say, no, I cannot help you. Then I added the realm of people working to develop this new field. Joe Opie was writing his book on reciprocal inhibition. Arnold Lazarus was doing his thing. Albert Bandura was laying the foundation in his psychotherapy as a learning process manuscript. And there were techniques being developed. So that's what attracted me, being able to reply to concrete issues such as facing that young man. Next question. Okay. And what are your most important contributions to research and practice in clinical psychology? I suppose that history will recognize two areas of importance. The first one is, again, you need to understand what the times were like. This was a period of time when there were no treatment, behavioral treatments for generalized anxiety disorder. We had the phobics disorders well in hand, but when you face someone with generalized anxiety disorder, there were none at, at the time. So uh, putting together the relaxation methods and, uh, and uh, basic imagery with some exposure, but with uh, the, the fact that with exposure, you are running the risk of increasing the discomfort. So I was searching for a method using relaxation and imagery to control the anxiety at each level. It became a useful tool. I named it Anxiety Management Training and eventually published a book on how to use this method. Later on, it dawned on me that there are some commonalities in emotional regulation, and then 
saw the application of AMT, as I called it, to anger management. And therein we developed what was called, or at the time, anger management training. So there's that one development that I am willing to take credit for. The other is that eventually through some clinical practice, I developed the idea that the imagery techniques we were using in behavioral therapy could be applied to fostering positive behaviors, healthy behaviors, and worked with the ski team to see if the use of relaxation plus imagery could improve their performance. We, we quickly found that this was indeed possible and a, and a number of research articles came out, mainly from physical educators rather than psychologists. I named this methodology, visual, motor, behavioral, rehearsal, as a descriptive term. And today you can find in historical books on his head, a reference to VMBR if they adopted the technique in their study. So I have crossed over and become known as not only a clinical psychologist, but also a sports psychologist. I was in fact the first psychologist to be named as a sport, official sport psychology for an Olympic training, Olympic team. And I served as a sport psychologist for five Olympic teams in the past. So there you are. Fascinating. Next. Thank you. Um, how can we do a better job of disseminating CBT to clinicians? Well, I would do something drastic as an experiment sometime. That is, it seems to me that reading journal articles about CBT can be a drudgery because there is this long format. I think that the appeal of reading a journal is the findings. So instead of having to plow through the history, introduction, methodology, uh, then you get to the results. Why not try and put a results section in front of the introduction and methodology? You can always look in to the later part of the article for those information. Maybe uh, this will make the dissemination more attractive, or at least a chore of reading a journal article. 
less difficult. And what do you believe are the biggest challenges facing clinical science? Well, the, when you go to these days through a workshop or a convention or a conference, it's amazing how many new findings there are in terms of interventions. I think that we have made great strides in developing the techniques, but their number of psychotherapeutic or cognitive behavioral therapy types of interventions is been going out of the hand. A new one develops almost overnight. And then there's a brief series to support the efficacy. And then it's dropped into the clinical realm for practice. I think the prolific number of ideas is a great boost to keeping your association active and viable. But I uh, honestly believe that it's gotten out of hand. Maybe we need a moratorium to stop and look and at what we have now and study factors regarding our current interventions to see more fundamentals. Well, that's just my opinion. Next question. What changes would you want to see in graduate training and uh, teaching in psychology? Oh, I am. I have some radical ideas about that too. Let's start with high school. More and more so, you find students eligible to take advanced placement courses. These effectively are meant to be beyond the usual high school level. And in fact, are often offered as substitutes for the same type of course, same content course, where the student gets to college. If that is the case, if an advanced placement course replaces or, or can, can meet the credit requirement at the college level, then that says that the college and the AP course are equivalent. So why not make that, in fact, the case and take out the intro courses that are offered in the undergraduate schools and replace those courses with more advanced or practical media. So it would free up if you give an advanced placement credit, you're saying you don't have to take the intro course and we don't need that intro level course. We can replace that intro course by something else. 
The other idea I have is for the development of a new course called Behavioral Change, which would be focused on various interventions that come not simply from clinical or cognitive behavioral therapy, but social psychology as an interventions in their own ways. Uh, environmental social people have their own ideas about how to foster change. And I owe industrial organizational majors learn another sequence. And even if we look at addiction counseling, they have their own ideas about what is necessary for change. It's time to share and integrate these different approaches. Next question. What areas or issues do you feel CBT needs to address more in the future? Well, my old war cry during SGA and during my presidential year is still an issue. Diversity, diversity, diversity. The A, B, A, A, B, A, B, C, T. That's a tongue twister. Is now beginning again to focus on diversity. In my presidential year, we reached out and found a pool of people who had not been affiliated with CBT and who were interested. They still exist, they're still reachable, and they're still available. Greater activity needs to be adopted to deal with this deficit. Okay, this is my last one for you. How has membership in ABCT impacted your career? Well, it provided a focus, a single focus for my activities. All of my, almost all of my research was in the field of cognitive behavioral therapy. All of my professional organizational activities centered on cognitive behavioral therapy affiliations. I think it was remarkable that we, my interest and focus and life was connected with this behavioral therapy phenomenon. I will also say, since we're talking about the end of a career, that this might be my last interview. I am 87, no, I just made 88. I'm 88 
years old and I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease disorder, which is a progressive terminal disease that I'm doing the darndest to, to delay the end state. I've already survived several years. And so this may be, in fact, my goodbye interview. I appreciate it being recognized by the association. But I will not yet say goodbye. Only See you later. That's the end. Dr. Slim, thank you so much for being here today. We're so thankful and honored that you took the time to have this interview with us.